Steve, this is the Veterinary Career Success Show, so a good start point to our conversation, I think, is just, why don't you give us a little backstory? Because you, you have had an interesting and varied career, which is part of the reason why I would want to have you on the show. Uh, so you you have been and are a veterinarian. Uh, you have been a business owner. You have been a coach to me and many others. And you are now, alongside being a veterinarian, a farmer, uh, but not perhaps what people think. So in your own words, Steve, give us your story. Well, I'll do the farmer bit real quick and then go to the beginning. So I have been a horse farmer for 35 years. We have a riding center and we cut hay and we have horses and so on. But now uh, we're a flower. I'm a flower farmer. My wife, who's a veterinarian, she is Mrs. Botany. And we are going to grow this year. Oh, probably an excess of 200 species of flowers. We're going to probably have several hundred thousand flowers. And we have tourists come to walk and skip and sing through the fields and cut bouquets of flowers. And, of course, you've been there, Dave, so you know, you know what we do. The farm is incredible, Steve. And it was a real pleasure to, to visit you and Dan and, and the girls. Um, and your menagerie of, of animals in the <laughs> house and a veritable um, you know, pr proper, proper wildlife extravaganza, including chasing wild turkeys around the farm in, in the snow time. But you know, I haven't seen it in full bloom, and and that is a sadness for me because the photos I see of Instagram, and if you've not seen them, guys, check out Lachlan Botanicals on Instagram, are just mind blowing. Like I I I require a photo shoot there um, next time next time I can get on a plane, just so you know, I'm, I'm going to drop in <laughs> probably unannounced. I'll be so, it'd be so good. Um, I, I'm, I'm think I'm going to name that guest room that you're in the Nichols, uh, <laughs> the, the Nichols like suite, the, the nickel, yeah. the nickel suite. What an honor. Yeah. Now, how the, how the heck did you end up a flower farmer? Well, we have this 93 acre farm and, uh, we do the horse thing. And, uh, I mean, we love flowers. We love people. And uh, a neighbor had a lavender farm, and he was drawing a lot of people into the neighborhood. And we thought, well, we'd do something different but similar. And uh, with the idea that we would slowly transition, you know, into part-time veterinarians, because we're in our 60s now, and, and then probably into – I would just be a consultant for veterinarians. I'd no longer be a clinician. So I'd be a, a clinician, coach, mentor, speaker, flower farmer. So yeah, so we're transitioning quite nicely. Talk us back through your career because you've wound up in veterinary medicine. I think you're kind of a, in some ways a bit of a, a poster child for early success, driving hard, getting after it, big dreams. At a time that it was... You know, we think about life being a bit hard just now from a, you know, COVID and, and many other inconveniences we have in our life just now. But you cast out into the world of business at a time when it was a very kind of scary, uncertain landscape to sort of do that on, which I am always in awe of the price of borrowing money back when you set out. It was kind of oh. crazy, but it was when you started to do it that's kind of mind-boggling. So talk us through your early years in veterinary medicine. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm married to my classmate. We've been together almost 40 years, uh, um, uh, including the time before we got married. And uh, so in the last year of veterinary school, we started looking for jobs, and, and uh, we were in love. And there weren't very many jobs. Um, uh, the best we were going to get, I think, was uh, uh, we're in the province of Ontario in Canada. It's quite a large province. We were going to be like seven hours apart if we got these jobs. 
and uh, we were just interviewing for them, and they paid miserably. They paid seventeen thousand dollars, which, like in today's money, is twenty five cents. It was just horrible, and and uh, um, and then I saw this ad for a job in Nova Scotia in Halifax on the East Coast, and uh, I spoke to see my father is from the East Coast, so I have relatives there, so I have an appeal to go there. And I interviewed with this man, and it turns out uh, he had seven clinics. So he was quite an entrepreneur. He was 30 years older than I was. And he became one of my most uh, influential mentors. But anyway, I got a job with him, and I talked him into hiring Diane as well. So we were 24 years old because we, you did not have to have a bachelor degree to get into veterinary school. So we 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 were graduated with our DVM and we were 24 years old, total babes, and we left the nest and we went to Halifax. What was interesting about Halifax, Dave, is this gentleman, Dr. Ainsley Ross Ainsley. I love the man. He's he's passed. If he was alive now, he'd be 95. He was a 1952 graduate. He taught me so much. He paid production commission which was he was one of the first people in North America to do it. And I just had this idea, Dave, that, uh, that I had a fire in my belly and, uh, and my woman by my side. And, well, didn't we start making $100,000 a year as a couple? We were living in a $300 a month apartment in the bottom of a clinic, basically rolling in money. I didn't even know what to do with it. Every Saturday night, we'd go out and just – go to the fanciest restaurant and eat desserts. I learned all these foods that were just being invented at the time, like cheesecake and <laughs> Caesar salad. They were new in the early 80s. But yeah, so so what happened is uh, we had our student loans paid off in like four months. And uh, we bought a horse farm 18 months after graduation. And I used that to leverage my first clinic that I bought from Dr. Ainsley. And then in rapid su succession, I borrowed money. Remember, this is 1980s at 20%. So by the yeah, time I was 20, terrifying. I don't know. It was by the time I was 27, I had three clinics. So you bought them all from Dr. Ainsley or did you acquire? No, I bought, I bought one from him. And then I created one from scratch. And then I, a third one I took over from some other veterinarians. Now, can I hit pause for a second? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, you, you refer to him in, you know, with great affection. Oh, yeah. Um, what made him such a good mentor? We, uh, a lot of people are interested in this question, but for you, what made Dr. Ainsley such a good mentor to you? Well, that's, that's a good question. There's a number of things. The one thing that I want to be clear about is uh, – Back in the day, we worked stupid hours. You know, this is this is the 50, 60 hour a week thing. And I do not recommend it. It's probably contributed to my burnout later. But Dr. Ainsley was a wonderful role model for working hard and, and getting ahead. He had a really good sense of humor. He was a good businessman, and he would have your back. He never threw you under the bus. So as a young veterinarian, oh, here's, here's a tip, young veterinarians. Uh, so I told you that Dr. Ainsley had seven clinics, and he worked very hard. So initially, when I was working for him on production, I would take every shift they would give me. So I was working 12 out of 14 days and uh, three nights a week and every Saturday because I was being paid. The more I worked, the more I made. Right. And I'd go to all these different hospitals, Dave, and you'd always meet these older people because I was young. I was 24, you know, with a face like a young John Lennon or something, you know. Like, you, you know me, what I look like and what I weigh now. You know, I was very thin and a uh, little, sh little shirt and tie and a mullet. 
and uh, and and all these people would say, you know, uh, well, Doctor Ainsley did this, and Doctor Ainsley did that. So I figured out how to uh, enfranchise people to trust me using Doctor Ainsley as my crutch, because. I did phone him all the time asking for advice early on and I would yeah. talk to him about cases. So these people that I'd look at their, you know, the medical records were on recipe cards back then. There's no computers. Yep. And I would look and I'd see do- nobody but Dr. Ainsley would, would had seen them. And I, I, I would take the offensive and I'd greet them. And I'm always very nice. I, I, I quite like people. I would always decide, I would find something I would like about these people. And I would like them and I would start talking to them and I would say, I can see, you know, that Dr. Ainsley has seen Sammy quite a number of times. And then I would tell them, everything I would tell them was true, but it was to build their faith in me. I, I'd say, I love Dr. Ainsley. I get to work with Dr. Ainsley on many occasions. Dr. Ainsley and I discuss cases all the time. You know, and then in the case of this dog, when I'm treating the ears, you know, I'm going to treat Sammy's ears just the same way Dr. Ainsley does. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, guys, but when you're a young vet, you have this huge prejudice. It's just human nature. You're young and you're being compared to old doctor. So with what I've just said, take what I said, take what you like, throw away what you don't like, and make it your own. You have to get people on your side in order to treat their pet. Right? 100%. Makes sense, Dr. Dave? It certainly does. Now, I heard also, in, as you were speaking, three things there that, that came out of me as being a good mentor. The first one was being available. You asked mm-hmm. him a lot of questions, so he was clearly available for you. The second thing yeah. is be good, good enough to know the answers to the questions. Yeah, and he then, was a good surgeon, for example, very good surgeon. Right. And then the third thing is that he had your back. You know, so th- there's three yeah. important things that people could take away to when you're looking for a mentor, you know, somebody yeah. that's good, somebody that is available and somebody that has your back when, when things don't work out. So, so that's useful in of itself. All right. So you've got these clinics, you've got this debt, it's 20%, but you're, you know, you're making money. Everything's good. You mentioned burnout. So talk us through yeah. like, what happens next. Well, if I could go back to the 20% for a moment, Dave, mm. um, and, and then I'm going to go to the burnout. So the, with the 20%, um, uh, what I learned is that I didn't know as much about management as I thought I did. In fact, I knew bloody little. And uh, so there were some periods of time where we ran out of money. One particular winter, we ran out of heating oil, and we couldn't buy any. So I had to either I had to stay warm between my clinic, my car with Diane, and sitting in front of the fireplace, or going to bed or having a shower. That was about a month. Mm. Of, so, so I learned an awful lot about management. I made a lot of mistakes. I invented mistakes that have never before been known and never be, never since been repeated. But um, all those things did I add to that. my stress. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the stress, the stress started to uh, build, but you know, I had a family. So uh, about three years having, after having all the clinics, uh, we had a family. Uh, two amazing girls, uh, two years apart kind of thing. And so I raised my family and um, I sold one clinic and I merged two into quite a, quite a good clinic, you know, like a 4,000 square foot, 15 employee, quite good clinic at the time. But that wasn't good enough for me, Dave. I had to have 
one of the best clinics in Canada. So I embarked on uh, building a 15,000 square foot, $3 million behemoth. And uh, I think that broke me doing it. Turned into a great clinic, but, uh, you know, it's a, a story for another day how that happened. But, yeah, so I, I burned out um, uh, shortly after we built that practice. I am from Ontario. That's where my family is all from. And I, But I moved away to Nova Scotia for 25 years. Well, part of the burnout, I think, was we decided to sell our interest. We had a half interest in this behemoth and moved back to where our family was in Ontario. And then really the wheels just fell off the cart for about, uh, I don't know, oh, probably about six years. Um, lots of, yep. well, it turns out, okay, here's another tip, everybody. One out of five people have mental illness. So essentially if you're yep. human or if you know a human, Mental illness will touch your life. So for me, um, I was diagnosed with uh, bipolar type 2. But the tip I want to give you guys is this one. I saw about four different shrinks, and uh, I'm self-insured. So essentially, I would pay $100 and sit and talk to people. I, I didn't have a plan or whatever. And I spent thousands talking to people who did not do much for me, even though now that I know about bipolar, I was giving them all the symptoms. Like essentially, I'm either really, I was either super happy or wanted to stay in bed. It's not complicated. And fortunate, fortunately, Dave, my doctor set up a, a Zoom appointment with an excellent psychiatrist. And she diagnosed me uh, about five years ago. And uh, so I take lithium. And uh, with bipolar folks, you're either really high or really low. And the aim of lithium is to, is to keep that sine wave amplitude low. Mm -hmm. And we just about got it right. Uh, Dave knows me well. Currently, I'm, I'm fairly good energy. I, but when I'm down... Um, most people don't know unless they know me really well. So I put on a good show. But yeah, I totally burned out. And, and, and for sure, for sure, it was all the cumulative hours. I worked way too hard. I took on way too many projects. And, um, you know, Dave, uh, when I built that hospital, I was the general contractor. So uh, for those that are listening... I put on a hard like as I I actually have these skills. I put on a hard hat and work boots and went on the site every day and managed the carpenters and the plumbers and all these things. I saved myself a million dollars, but I broke my mind doing it. So it wasn't worth it. Was not worth it. You know, and this is not a sad story. I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. It's a good story. I'm the hero of the story, so I'm I'm my favorite person, right? <laughs> Any story that's about me is of high interest to me. But my point is, <laughs> my point is, um, you got to take care of yourself, folks. That's what I'm committing myself to. I've studied mindfulness and positive psychology. Essentially, I saved myself, and I'm not a not too bad a little teacher. I like to teach how to use some of these tools so that we can manage stress. We all know about the suicide rate. Uh, it's way too high. Uh, you know, what can we do? All right. So Steve, um, I want to, there's a couple of questions I want to ask. One is, one is how, how far back do you think it, you were first aware? Have you reflected on when you first think, yeah, there was, I knew there was something not, quite right with me then and and what what it what was it that you noticed to start with so that's question one and then i would actually like to move into 
just a little bit more of a conversation about suicide because I, I, I want to relay a story of when we first met. Um, yeah. A kind of a poignant moment. I'd, yes. I'd yeah. Well, it was po- very poignant for both of us. Mm. So, yeah. So, Dave, um, I think I was in my 40s because when I was in my 40s, I was doing a lot. Like I was on the Canadian mm-hmm. Veterinary Medical Association National Council. I, I chaired some committees. Uh, I chaired a business committee. I, I was on an animal welfare committee. I was on a subcommittee for uh, vaccinations when they were first learning about uh, uh, some of the issues with over-vaccination. Uh, I helped run a medical conference. Uh, yeah, I, I started an emergency hospital. It's always better, uh, people, to work with your colleagues. And I started an emergency hospital and created equal shares for every clinic in town and made it so that we all work together. But you do all these projects, and they mess you up. So what I started mm-hmm. noticing, Dave, is I'd get bummed out. And for mm-hmm. anybody who knows depression well, what happens is you become as dumb as a brick. I couldn't think. I couldn't think. Like when I'm happy, sometimes my mind, it feels like beautiful mind. I can actually see things moving around. I can put things in place. I can think three-dimensionally. I can solve puzzles real quick. But yeah, I'd, I'd have episodes being stupid. So stupid. You know, um, I was, I was wanting to, uh, my practice had plateaued. I remember really well, my, my practice had kind of plateaued. And I was doing all this management and study groups. And I remember talking to a speaker from, uh, from upstate New York. And, and I was talking to him. I was saying, well, you know, we've done this. We're tracking our active client numbers, right? We're, we're, you know, we've got this protocol for phone backs. We, we're doing this with postcards. This is before email. We're doing this. And I just don't understand. And I now know that what happened is basically I was so depressed that I was negative. And negativity begats lack of productivity. Does that make sense? It does. I want to write that one down. Negativity begets loss of productivity. I like that. Can I give you the corollary of that? It's real fast. Yeah. There was was a study, Dave, uh, Case Western Reserve University, David Cooper Ryder. And what they did is they studied the transcripts and videos from uh, business meetings of of, uh, 60 different companies. And the researchers would allocate whether the words and the tones of voice were positive or negative. And when the words were positive and the tones of voice were positive, these companies like had like 20% more profit. Mm -hmm. So in other words, there's no place for cynicism and sarcasm in a business meeting. It actually costs you money and it costs you mental health too. And that, that feels there's, there's something very analogous about that study and what we see in the, the, tribe of mentors you choose to hang with and, and the influence they have in your life, which which does lead me nicely to that moment where, you know, you and I first met, I think it's May 2015. Yep. In Washington. In Washington, in the National Harbor. Yep. Uh, we're bo- both speaking uh, what was probably one of the last CVCs before it became Fetch. We went out met you, you yeah. know, enjoyed what you were, you know, you were saying and talking on and we went out for drinks and there was five of us sat around the table and, you know, um, I will leave names out, but they're all very important people to me uh, at, at different phases in their career. They're all people I thought, wow, there's such a great energy around this table. And th- every time I went to that conference, particularly in DC, I met people that ended up having a very big influence in my life. And you're one of those people. Well, everyone at that table, I thought was going to be one of those people. And then at the next conference, uh, 
which was in the August, I think we're all there again, except one of us isn't there. And yeah. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what happened there. And then in, in San Diego, uh, I learned that one of those people had committed suicide. Um, and yeah. It was so under the radar, and it was so much like a gut punch because I, I hadn't gotten to know this person. But the time I'd spent with this person, I knew instinctively that this person was going to be a great friend. And and so we stayed in touch and f- for a little and then it kind of went cold. But that often happens when you're jumping between conferences and you don't pick up again. And it was just a kind of gut punch. And it's for anybody that's been in veterinary medicine for any length of time, that you you don't get used to it, but you become you know, it's almost, you're not surprised at times, except you are because you never see the ones coming. That first meeting was, uh, you know, it's poignant to think back on it because of the, the loss around there. But I didn't know, uh, quite what you were dealing with. Um, and I remember we were stood on the roof of the San Diego convention center. And I remember us, we stood for hours just chatting away and watching that sunset over the aircraft carriers and, and just setting the worlds to rights and just having the most beautiful conversation. It's almost like time stood still. And, we're, and we talked about uh, a lot of things. And then there was one moment I remember you saying that you you fought the Balrog that night. I was talking about some of the challenges I had, clouds on the horizon. Um, and you, 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 I remember you saying, you said, I fought the Balrog that night and you'd had you know you were speaking why don't you tell us that story there because oh, you literally shared this story in its graphic nature with me a week ago i had no idea this is what you meant um, well can you tell uh, folks what the balrog is so the balrog yeah. sorry is yeah so the um if you're into lord of the rings you'll know what i'm talking about if you're not then basically it is a giant demon of the underworld this fiery ethereal but terrifying demon, demonic force that comes out from the uh, minds of Moria and Gandalf, one of the heroes, protagonists, fights and they tumble battling in this huge life or death duel into the pits of the the world where Gandalf finally triumphs. But it's a terrifying monster that's basically your living nightmare um, before you uh, that confronts Gandalf. Yeah, it's um, yeah, and uh, so who's ever listening? Uh, Dave and I are total nerds, and, <laughs> and I think a lot of veterinarians are. We just love the Lord of the Rings. So Gandalf, the wizard, was the gray wizard, and uh, he did defeat the Balrog down in the depths of hell essentially. And he was reborn and he became Gandalf the white. And as Gandalf the white, he was even more powerful. The story is, um, uh, this is early on. uh, So what I don't remember is if I was on lithium or not. But I certainly was having episodes of highs and lows. And uh, when you and I were in uh, uh, in Washington in May, uh, I felt like a million bucks. And I, I gladly agreed to speak in December in San Diego. But unfortunately, I was in a low. Now, my wife came with me. And uh, we were staying, I think, at a Hilton. It was a nice hotel, and I had yet to speak. I was in my room. I was really nervous about this talk. I had already spoken um, uh, I don't know. I'd probably spoke on this topic ten or fifteen, twenty times now. I'd spoke at a bunch of vet schools, and uh, yeah, I spoke at NAVC and VMX and a bunch of other ones. So I wasn't a rookie, but um, but I was petrified so we're getting ready to go give this talk and we're up in our hotel room where i think we're on the 11th floor and uh diane was in the bathroom getting uh, she doesn't even know this she didn't know i still haven't told her this 
Diane was getting her going to get her hair done, and I was just petrified. And uh, one of the aspects of mindfulness uh, uh, is learning to breathe and, and learning to modify your breath. But, I mean, I was just panicking. I was just panicking, and uh, I thought, okay, well, I'll go get some fresh air. And so I went to the edge of the balcony. I had this like panoramic view of San Diego Harbor. It's gorgeous. Arizona battleship is there. What happened is I started getting voices in my head, like like a demon or something. So I heard this jump, 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 jump. And I was just like fighting for my life. I was holding the balcony and I was just shitting myself. And uh and uh Back to another Lord in the Ring image where Pippin is all he almost loses his mind to the orbs. Uh, uh, they're, they're in a room in, uh, in Isengard and Gandalf saves him. That's what happened. Basically, I was holding onto this railing and like electricity was just shooting through my body and I like was telling me to throw myself off the balcony because then I wouldn't have to give the goddamn talk. And maybe that. You know, maybe that would save people from having to listen to it. But I did manage to let go of that balcony, push myself back into the room, and I just sat in the bed. And I just started breathing. I was just breathing for my life. Just <sighs> And, and uh, what I learned from that experience was uh, that it's pure mindfulness. If you actually feel your breath, like which I sure did, <sighs> and you feel it, you you can't think while you're shooting breath up your nostrils. You think of it, and so it's basically I rescued myself. And uh, yeah, and Diane and I went down to the, did the talk. It was pretty good. I won't say I hit it out of the park, but I was congratulated afterwards. And then I think you and I went out for dinner with some other folks. And I laughed and I giggled and whatnot like it never happened. But it did, but it did happen. You just had no idea. I mean, even as you're describing that there, you know, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps, but not in a good way. Just in a, you like, holy shit. Cause this, this is the day after that. Like we, this, we were watching the sunsets right at the end of the conference. And, you know, you confided in me that you fought the battle rock the night before and i had no idea that's what you meant um and so i uh, first of all i I just want to thank you for your courage in sharing your struggles and also in sharing that that story particularly because you know i've said to people before you know i've done a lot of interviews and a lot of podcasts now and the the slightly macabre side of me if i could choose to do interviews it would be to ask the questions of those that aren't with us anymore you know, what happened how how did it get to yeah. this not not but not for the sake of being macabre but to learn to to tell that story and to help um but it's a story that never gets told and and you know you just told the story of what happens, but you also find a way, this rescue. And so this yeah. is really where I'd like to get to in our conversation is, you know, you have been, t certainly to me, somebody that's taught me much more about the value of mindfulness um, and contemplation. Um, you're a trained coach. You've done multiple mindfulness retreats. Um, I'm, cu I'm curious to know what ways you know, what is maintenance and what does rescue look like? And and how do we use this? I know that's a massive topic to ask yeah. you to give a, a very short answer on, but but well, what can we take away from this? Okay. Um, well, let's go back just a tiny bit. What I wanted to say is it is evidence-based for sure. There um Five years ago, six years ago, when I first started speaking, there was 1,300 uh, 
evidence-based papers about the different benefits of mindfulness. And I'm sure that, that it, that's probably grown a hundredfold. So it's evidence-based, Dave, that when you breathe and when you feel your breath, certain things happen. You know, you can reduce stress. You can reduce anxiety. You can regulate your heart rate. You can improve your mental clarity. Yada, yada, yada. There's dozens of benefits. So my theory is, now this is not a, a proven, but my theory is that mindfulness prevented suicide. Now, we don't have evidence space for it. We don't have 100 guys that are all going to jump over the balcony and 50 of them, you make them breathe and see who jumps. We don't know that. I, so I'm, I'm like N equals 1. But I'm pretty damn sure. But I do know that we can teach people to breathe to handle stress and anxiety. But I'm going to answer your, your question, I think, simply, which will open the door for future talks. There's a psychologist called Abraham Maslow, M-A-S-L-O-W. Mm -hmm. I, th I know you know him, Dave. Yep. And he has the hierarchy of needs. And so, it, folks, if we think of a pyramid with a point at the top and the base widest at the bottom, you start adding words and you go towards the top. And you start with what you need to live, like oxygen, water, food, and you keep climbing, shelter, safety, companionship, da 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 da. And right up at the top, it's self actualization, you know, where you could meditate and so on. I'm suggesting that we can rescue ourselves. By giving ourselves what we deprive ourselves of, which is the basics of life. We deprive ourselves of oxygen by holding our breath and getting anxiety. We work without eating. We don't hydrate. We don't move our bodies. So very, very simply, there's a half a dozen little exercises I can teach folks. Um, you're about to go into the exam room and you're scared to death because Mrs. Jones is a monster. You take a few breaths, you sip your water bottle, you take a couple of raisins, you stretch your arm, you smile, you think kind thoughts, and you go in. But each, each one of those little things requires some teaching and expansion of. But there's lots of ways to rescue yourself. You know, my father taught me, Dave, that... Every time you're feeling sorry for yourself, go help somebody. Right. There's another quote. You're just throwing them out. You know, that's gold. To fill well, somebody you, else's bucket to fill your own, right? Yeah. Well, when we're veterinarians, we are helping people. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it. But for the most part, if, you know, if we adhere to our oath, we are helping. Now you, helping is a kindness. Now layer that into trying to truly understand the other people. Learn this, you know, this is what young people can, can do is they can learn the skills of communication. They can learn emotional intelligence. They can learn principles of like there are, there's there's all kinds of things. There's neuro linguistic programming. There's there's ways to speak to bring people on your side. You know, broadcasters and people in commercials do that all the time. Now listen, Dave Nickel, I'm about to tell you something that you are gonna absolutely love. So what are you gonna what do you do? I'm gonna hate it. No, you start thinking, oh, what am I gonna love about it? There's there's so many tricks in communication, so many. So what I do is I, I find ways to love people, to make to be kind to them, and to use the words that are going to make them feel right. I'm going to speak differently um, to a big rugby player covered in tattoos than I am to a 70-year-old woman. But I know how to speak to each of them and to make them feel important and good. It's just, it's just a kindness. I'm just going to show them a kindness. 
So lots of topics. So we're gonna have we're gonna go a little deeper in this. Uh, you and I, you're gonna be doing a wee session, uh, one yep. of our rock star sessions within the VEDEX community. Um, That'll be. I'm looking forward. That's gonna be amazing. It will, and yeah, some of you right now will be listening to this, and it'll be after the point at which we've done it, which is boohoo for you. <laughs> yeah. Look us up, uh, but. If you are this this episode is going to be going out um, this week, and right now it's it's the start of the third week in March. So if you have the chance to tune in, um, the way you're going to do that is to be a member of the Ventry Career Success Group on Facebook. Minimally, uh, if you're within one of the Vedex communities, then that will form one of our regular rock star sessions. But this this topic's too important just to stay within the heart, the core of the community. So we're going to be putting that into Ventry Career Success and opening that up to you guys as a sort of one-off. Um, I'm going to call it a gift, Steve, because I think, I think your teachings are a gift. And there's so much more. Like you're not going to learn everything there is to learn from Steve Noonan in a one-hour session or a you know, a 40 minute podcast. But if you're smart, then you might make that the first step of many on a journey. Uh, cause this man's got a lot to teach us. Um, Steve, it's been a, a, a great pleasure. Like we don't have a lot of time just now, yeah. but first thing I want to say is thank you for being a mentor, uh, an inspiration, a friend, and most of all, just for being you and being here. Uh, because well, there's, you know what, there's others who've been in your shoes who aren't and who, and we all know them and, and we all miss them. You, Whoever you are right now, you have your version of that. So I, for one, am incredibly fucking grateful that you are still on this planet, sir. And, and, and I salute you for your, um, you know, your courage in telling that story, um, you know, it's going to take a little while for me to digest that properly, but it, it means a lot to me that you were willing to share that. And it means a lot to me because I know there's a lot of people that will benefit from that. Um, and, and you know, there's – just thank you. Oh, you Look, Dave, you're absolutely welcome. Um, I, I guess I want to make a really quick point again, um, but I think it's an important one. I, I've been carrying this in my head for six years or whatever, mm. and I started thinking about how I would articulate it, which which you heard. And so a couple of times I practiced uh, how I would articulate it, and I would do it when I'm shaving or having a shower or whatever. I, I break down sobbing. It's just mm. sob and sob and sob. Now, that I'm past that now, or you would have heard me sob today. And the point I want to make is we all have stuff bottled up inside us and it's just tearing you apart inside. You got to find somebody to talk to about it. And, and if you cry, you cry, get it out, get yourself feeling better. I, I could not endorse what you've just said more. Um, you know, you, you know, your, your version is a harrowing extreme but none of us escapes life without dings and dents of one form or another. Uh, and I just, I couldn't, I couldn't applaud what you just said more, you know, get help. You know, I, I have seen coaches, I've seen counselors for the tough stuff that I've had to deal with. And I'm not saying that to try and steal any of the moment from you here, but just to add my voice uh, to that, you know, I'm very happy to share um, the things I do to look after my mental health. Cause it's just like going to the gym, isn't it, Steve? Like, yeah. We happily talk about going to the gym and us lifting weight. How much did you lift today? Ooh, I benched this. And, and it's yeah. all macho and okay to talk about that, but it seems like it's not okay to talk about some of the stuff that's just as heavy as yeah. lifting at 200 pounds. Not that I ever lifted that on a bench, but you can be, your brain can be lifting and bearing, not lifting, but bearing or struggling under the weight that seems a lot bigger than that. And 
counselling, I can tell you why it works. But getting it off your mind with somebody that can help you is huge. But Steve, the other thing you said in that interview was, you know, you saw counsellors, but you 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 also had an undiagnosed condition that is is very commonly associated with suicidal ideation. Yeah, if I if I would interject, um, I paid out of pocket to my guys, and you know, you go to someone because uh, they have a shingle, and you think they know what they're doing, mm. and if I was a negative, cynical person, and I am not those folks continued to let me talk when clearly they either did not have the skills or they just wanted to, you know, continue to keep me coming. And, yeah. uh, so, and, and the, the reason I'm saying that folks is not to be negative or snotty or anything, but if you don't like the man or woman that you that you just, just leave them. You have no obligation to them, right? This is your life. Find a man or woman that you can talk to and really trust. And you'll know. you When you trust people, you'll know. You get that little tingle, that little tickle or whatever in your heart when you're telling people something and you get a response for them that, that lets you know they really see you as opposed to, you know, you know the stereotypical joke psychiatrist Who's just yeah yeah hmm stroke their beard and how do you feel about that? They're not even listening to you. You know they're watching. Mm -hmm. You know they're 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 doing a video game behind your back. So make sure you get somebody you trust and that you you know that they hear you. That's a great point, um, okay. Steve. Thank you. All right. So much for your uh, input again. Uh, it's always a pleasure speaking to you, sir. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And oh, that I look great. forward to doing our session next week. Yeah, me too. All right. Looking forward, Dave. Uh, had a great, great day with your, uh, uh, your assistant, Alfred, today. Um, and uh, you've got a super organization, Dave. VEDEX is, uh, I'm so proud of what you've done. So proud of what you've done. Uh, you're like the hardest working man in veterinary uh, communications that I know. So just keep up the good work. Well, that's very kind of you, Steve. Glad you're part of it. All right. Have a good night. S sleep well, my prince. <laughs> that is from Hamlet, <laughs> folks. Not fight any bout. Uh, may you not. Yeah, I know it's not just it's not just pillow talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Good night. <laughs> Bye. Take care, Steve. Okay, bye-bye.